Machi, welcome to our show. Thank you. And uh, I want to just uh, quickly give you guys a um, uh, hint. Uh, pay close attention if you are interested in Asia or if you are interested in uh, publishing your game uh, in China. We're going to cover a lot of stuff uh, going forward about uh, what it takes to bring your game to China or what does it take to bring your game in Asia. And we're going to talk about localization and the government policy and uh, how to scale your game. I think one of the very important things these days, uh, especially in this crowded market, when you have a good game, how you can scale. We're going to be back in a minute. Check the description below if you want to join our community and meet awesome people from the game industry. Mache, let's start from the beginning. How did you end up in the uh, game industry? How did you start making and developing games? And uh, what, what made you actually do gaming in the in first place? Well, then we have to go back to <laughs> the times when we were like kids, you know, uh, when we played Atari, Commodore 64, yeah. Spectrum. Uh, so I remember when I was five years old and back then in, in basically I'm from Poland. Back then it was the communist uh, party <laughs> and I got the Nintendo NES from my parents oh. on the birthday and it's like nobody had it, you know, at the time. So me as a five years old, so I plug into the, you know, 14 inch TV, you know, basically working and the first game that I remember playing was Contra, yeah. Oh. So that's the original and I got really hooked. I mean, I mean, I, I, I play a lot of soccer when I was outside of school, but then also every day I just play the Nintendo games and stuff. And then I, then I got uh, lucky to get Commodore uh, 64. I went to Amiga, Spectrum, Atari. Then I got my first PC, uh, emulator it was for four, eight, six. Um, Let me ask you, in that time, yeah. Nintendo was competing with Sony, right? Sony had uh, uh, some, some console. I right. Uh, but there will be a time that uh, a bit later, um, mm -hmm. when I was getting Nintendo, first Nintendo, but it was about 1990s, mm -hmm. and the first Sony was uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. So we still oh, have. It was a, Sega. Sega yes. was competing with Nintendo yes, in those days. It was the. But it's a, a bit a gap. Uh -huh. uh, Sega will be comparing maybe with Nintendo, Super Nintendo, mm -hmm. and uh, the newer generation, which I never had a chance to get into. Mm -hmm. Because at the time I went more into Amiga. Mm -hmm. uh, 500 and then after that PC uh, market mm -hmm. but to answer your question uh, how did I end up in the game industry because of course everybody mm -hmm. plays games right yeah. um, when I was about uh, 10 to 12 years old I was um, I was like the one the only kid like in the block that actually had the internet connections uh, back then and that's the time remember it was no Google no Yahoo nothing we used to do searches on Alta Vista uh, so what year was this? It was about uh, 1996 to 1998. 60, yeah. yeah. So, um, so at that time, we had no Google search engines, nothing. And there were publishers in Poland. They were like uh, having the trying to publish a game, you know, ba basically back then retail, you know, you sell mm -hmm. a floppy disk or CD. And I said, okay, I'll make websites for you guys. So I want to make. Um, uh, because I like to do coding at the time, mm -hmm. HTML, you know, basically back then no PHP, no nothing, just yeah, yeah, yeah. basic uh, HTML stuff, you know. And I I started making some websites for the game, so I was involved with the community. Uh, I helped like a CD project at the time, mm -hmm. uh, do some websites for the games, like with the, uh, with the uh, games like uh, Ireland Tycoon, you know, stuff mm -hmm. like that, uh, which I remember the most. Um, and that's what got me involved. And after that, I moved in and I had my website, you know, the a TV came to my house and the, and, the, and the radio station, they asked me like why I was like 12 years old and doing this stuff. And I say, I'm getting free games and this is something I enjoy. There's nothing better like 12 <laughs> yeah, year old I know, being right? in the game industry yes. at that age, right? That, that must yes. be wonderful. And that's, that's about 20, 23 years ago. So, oh, wow. and from that time, you know, even though back then it's like a kid, Mm. It's a passion that you do, and you know, I basically my whole life I know exactly what I want to do. I want to always be involved in the game. So let's move forward. Um, mm -hmm. Back in uh, around 2000, 2006, uh, 2012, I've been, uh, I've been. Uh, Sometimes I was in the US, 
and mm -hmm. sometimes I was in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically in Taiwan, I was involved with uh, the main company I was involved with uh, Tesoro, mm -hmm. Tesoro Gaming uh, techno Technology. And this company uh, used to be owned by I1. And I1 is the manufacturer, number one manufacturer in the world of uh, gaming keyboards. Mm -hmm. So companies like Razer, uh, SteelSeries, uh, Asus, uh, ROG, they all make keyboards from them. Mm -hmm. And basically the guys uh, ask, uh, we're in charge of the uh, Tesoro and they asked me to make a brand. So I entered the company, very quickly I got um, uh, promoted all the way to the acting CEO um, mm -hmm. because the uh, last CEO left, they had no replacement, so over one year I was there and it was mainly the harder part of the gaming but also eSport mm -hmm. and at that time like um, a major corporation with uh, Navy ga games, mm -hmm. Navi, uh, yeah. yeah Navi, everybody knows, uh, Virtus Pro, mm -hmm. uh, this is before they got sold out you know, uh, mm -hmm. so back then we, uh, we are the main sponsors of them together with uh, for Virtus Pro, uh, Virtus with, back then was BenQ and mm -hmm. for uh, Navi was for Steel Series. So you can still see like old uh, jerseys with our logo on mm -hmm. it. Uh, so, and also, of course, I was sponsoring a lot of smaller teams like Refuse in Greece, uh, Infuse in UK, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Mouse Sports. Uh, we did something, um, we did try to do something with Fanatics, you know, mm -hmm. the Fanatic gear, but it didn't work out. But we have a lot of involved and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, tournaments on ESL gaming. And then, Back in the about three to four years, four years ago, I had a call from um, uh, Wanda, and they say they are acquiring a company called Who Life, mm -hmm. and that was uh, and asked me to come to come to China and be basically the director of uh, business development. So, which year is this happening? That happened around early two thousand sixteen. Two thousand sixteen. Yeah. So you are leaving Taiwan to come from Beijing to uh, work on a mobile publishing. Basically, right? mobile. Yeah. So see, like I was doing the hardware stuff. My heart mm -hmm. is always in the software. Mm -hmm. So once I had this opportunity, I took it without Lovely. hesitation. Yeah. You know. Um, so basically, now I'm in the, uh, China, sorry, in Beijing, mm -hmm. and uh, now you mentioned like I'm between jobs. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. uh, next week, uh, I don't know when the video will come yeah, out, yeah. Yeah, but next week I'll be announcing. Uh, it's going to be something very big. Yeah. Um, so it's been planned for some time already. And um, probably I will leave a comment later I will, yeah, yeah, yeah. in your video and say, guys, this is where I am. And of yeah, course, yeah. you can check my link in you know, that, yeah. as well. Yeah. But, uh, yes. but that's not something that like between jobs, just it's a, it's a planned move to uh, Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know we had a talk before this, but I want to yes. keep my audience uh, waiting Here. for, the right, for yes. the right moment to get information. Um, so what I want to give to my audience, like a hinge also, is... So in 2016, you are moving to the mobile publishing, right? Right. It's going straight to the mobile publishing. And uh, prior to this, did you do any kind of, uh, because you were in a hardware business, right? Right. Did you do any kind of uh, mobile publishing? Did you do any kind of mo game development right. before? Or this was like fresh for you? Well, the gaming market is very overlapping, mm -hmm. to, yeah. to, to just say at least, right? Um, what we did is we had a lot of uh, business deals with uh, publishers and developers. Mm -hmm. Basically, like it's a uh, cooperation between, for example, like they give us some stuff inside the game. We put some QR codes on our products, you know, or we have skin the keyboards or mouses of this kind of in the game uh, team, right? Yes. So you get more players. Through, yeah. So or even the keyboard will make it like a League of Legends keyboard and stuff like this. If you remember a long, long time ago, like still series have their first like World of Warcraft game keyboard. Yeah. You know, that's something that uh, our factory back then did that, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of stuff like you stay involved with, you know. But if you ask me for developing, you know, this is the straight in, you know, straight in. And well, the good thing is that I have a background, so this is something I love. Mm -hmm. So I got inside the development system and uh, I was. Uh, it wasn't difficult for me, you know. You you already understood the whole psychology yes. of uh, yeah. of uh, the the game industry. You were a gamer yourself, right? So you were not so distant from the entire uh, entire industry, let's say, sure. right, of development. And um, when it comes to publishing, you already had established uh, connections, and you knew people who who were publishing games before, who were doing marketing for the games. So like the new job was just like another step forward in career right. development. Right. right. 
and basically in development since I'm so involved I still do consulting mm -hmm. um, I'm majoring both in mathematics and economics so mm -hmm. I'm pretty much net for numbers mm -hmm. so I do sometimes it's like a uh, help uh, gaming developers especially uh, do the uh, numerical designs for mm -hmm. their uh, economies and stuff mm -hmm. and my main uh, strength is in the games like RPG and uh, uh, strategy games so mm -hmm. you know it needs a lot of balance balancing yeah so even though I never like actually did developer side I still did consulting for that so mm -hmm. to balance games and there are a few games that are actually um, on NDA uh, cannot really mention it but uh, there's a few games that will show up uh, within one two years so you have you will see me in the credits for that so, yeah so. awesome awesome yeah. so uh, can you tell me a little bit about China let's say sure. about China like top 100 games in China um, I'm talking about mobile games mostly like how hard is it for somebody to get into like uh, let's say we have a guy somewhere in Europe or states or anywhere right and now th these guys are sitting there designing the game they want to get in the like uh, Chinese market how hard is it for them to get to the top 100 uh, apps right. here in games well um, the question first is um, why would they want to get to 100 mm -hmm. um, and should they because mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of uh, actually resources together and basically um, if a company like uh, for example from Europe wants to be in top 100 uh, probably they're giving up most of their revenue to the publisher in China mm -hmm. so up to 90-95% of the revenue will go to the publisher but in, in exchange the publisher will put the marketing efforts everything to make the game at the top uh, does it make economical sense? Maybe not, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, the developer It's job for them to actually calculate what makes sense for them um, Before the interview I was talking about mm -hmm. uh, this uh, example um, What's China amazing market is that we, we have around 700 million users that play phones uh, non-stop and we're talking about uh, People here. They don't play PC games console games uh, when people finish their work they go home they don't really have big tvs at home they play phones non-stop so the average duration of the user in china is very long mm -hmm. and then th at the same time they're spending a lot of money because they are keep playing the mobile games to the point the government in china wants to limit the n hours well, we are going to get to the government sure, government sure. question but it's it, it get to the point so so be because of that we have around 700 million people non-stop everyday log in playing games on different different uh phones different platforms and imagine you have a game for example like a racing game uh which only maybe five to ten percent people will ever play and let's say it's ten percent just some simple number mm -hmm. it's 70 million people in china An average person in china will spend about the same amount of money as people in the us mm -hmm. based on the revenues you know so now we have seven million users want to play racing game do you need to be one, top 100 overall no you just need to be top 20 in racing uh category in your own category right in your own category to actually make it big and let's say out of 70 million only one percent people see your game mm -hmm. Seven hundred thousand users they're paying very big money so if you're a small developer and you get the one percent of the people that like racing game you you make more money than maybe whole whole world all together mm -hmm. so that's a yeah that's a so let me just repeat this once again so we have seven seven hundred million people in china daily active right right on phones and if we say 10 percent of the market would be like 70 million people in let's say niche of racing games something example, like that yeah and uh what, what Mache is saying is if you guys can push your game in this niche in this market you are looking at some uh, crazy numbers crazy this, numbers this is this is something so how would somebody come here and let's say if they have the game and do that without a publisher with a pub local publisher uh, a co-publisher how, right. how would that work right, what's so your advice for for god let's say somebody now just have the, the racing game and he's thinking about china uh so basically they need to understand what they want to do in terms of the scope of the project um so we are talking about like uh, if they, the game is like, uh, de developed by very very big developer in Europe and US or is uh, developed by a small uh, medium sized company you know because they will be talking about the uh, two things um, ba basically first one is the revenue share so mm -hmm. how much revenue shares uh, 
that they are giving to um, publisher. And on average, uh, minimum is 70% to Chinese publisher will go just like mm -hmm. this. Why? Because uh, the usually the Android stores in China will take about 50% uh, revenue from that. So important, important for everybody to understand that right out of the, the, the bell is that Chinese store, like Android stores, the, the, the carriers, the right. operate store are taking 50% of the in-game purchases. Right? Makes sense, yeah. yeah. Okay. So of one dollar, you got 50 cents left. And that 50 cents, 35 cents will be to developer, uh, sorry, to publisher, and 15 cents will go to uh, developer. So you will get around 15 cents out of the dollar. That's your revenue. Which, again, when we're talking about the huge DAU, MAU in the stores, put together is a very big number. Uh, but when you get into the bigger and bigger publisher, your revenue shares become smaller. So when we're talking about top two uh, publisher, for example, Tencent and East, it could be as low as five, 10% of revenue shares, but it could get you to the top spot, in, at least for the first week. And mm -hmm. if the game performs well, so they will keep you there. Why Why they can do it, especially for example, for a company like Tencent, because they own the biggest uh, platform. So it's mm -hmm. their own traffic, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so it makes sense. However, it, only works for the game that is making big money already or they will not accept it so what's your second suggestion is you will find smaller publisher you know like mm -hmm. a, so you go to this was the number one option the second option with the smaller game is not going for the premium publisher right. so if you have a small game that's not super proven to have return on investment you're not looking at baidu tencent netist you're looking for a second tier publisher yes smaller publisher and and what the reason there are two reasons why because the first one the big big publisher like you just mentioned you know they not they don't have time or would not even pay attention to a game and the second one is that uh, if your game is small nobody really want to push it so you'll be paying more attention to more organic users traffic so those smaller publisher they might not really invest that much money money into the marketing but what they can do is they can help you to get the, all the government approvals to get your game in the Android stores in China and then and then based on that they can help you get some features and then you get some traffic from that mm -hmm. so it will not be we will not be 70 million users mm -hmm. going to your game but it will be one maybe one percent of the 70 million which is 700,000 but if you imagine you're a small a developer that's still a very big amount you know mm -hmm. and with a smaller uh, small publisher you your revenue shares can be as much as 30 to 50 percent so it's really depends it is the one thing is the revenue share the second one is mg and the, what do you mean by mg uh, mg is basically uh, the minimum guarantee uh -huh. and we split it into minimum guarantee which is recoupable we uh, basically um uh, i tell you i give you one million dollars and then the, I will not give you revenue share till I make, make a million dollars back. back. Yeah. And there's a license fee, which is I give you $1 million, but um, I start giving you revenue share right away. So the 1 million is just, I give you and I'm gone. So it's a more risk for the publisher. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let, let me go once again for, for the, the guys who are looking at this for the first time. So we mentioned like a minimum guarantee, MJ, right? Yeah. That means that um, somebody who wants to publish his game would make negotiations about what's the minimum guarantee from yeah. a publisher and the publisher would come out and say we can guarantee a million dollars of sales right. with this app and then they have two options right one is pay a million dollar in advance to the developer and start publishing game immediately and when they reach a million dollar in profits right right then they can start paying uh, the, the revenue share that was agreed on right what happens if for example they don't reach a million dollar in, in a certain amount of time well then basically they they, they publish it with money mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, is there any like uh, uh, liability uh, towards publisher that, or the developer can find a new publisher how would that work it depends on the contract to contract when i sign the contracts with the developers what i also often give them is like a basically a minimum user guarantee or minimum uh, uh, mg right mm -hmm. and basically we will con construct the contract that will pay some amount in the beginning like when we sign some some con uh, some amount when we launch the game and some kind at the end of one year so 
within the one year if for example i promise you i give you one million but again just like nine hundred thousand, then i have to pay you the, the difference yeah yeah so so it's um but this only happens usually when your game is extremely successful and your company is top 30 to 30 uh, global company mm -hmm. in the world if we are talking you are like a small indie company you know you can get mg but it will be very very small amount mm -hmm. um, let's see what the smallest uh, amount of uh, that you had in, in for some indie developer okay not for me because uh we were only working with the big uh, games but the small small India is about ten thousand US dollars to thirty thousand US dollars. So uh, let's once more refresh everybody on Vanda Group, right? Yeah. That, that was doing publishing. Your company is considered to be one of the, let's say, not the top publisher in China, but one of the highest right. uh, valued publisher. You had a good reputation. You published some of the amazing games. Right. Um, you, what was the minimum deal that Vanda, Vanda did, for example, while you were there? Well, when we talk about MGs, we would say 100,000 is very cheap. Okay. US dollars. And their MG is like 1 million, 2 million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about. Um, but let's not be a little bit, let's, let, let's not be crazy about the numbers too much because, uh, because the market is really inflated. So if you are a developer in Europe or in US or Middle East or whatever, and if you have one of the best games in the world right now, mm -hmm. top top five crossing in the world, you can you still can't expect MG more than three four million in mm -hmm. China. Yeah. So, so like, like the cap would be on like three, four? Uh, and that's already already way too over, you know. Mm -hmm. Because uh, because there's still all risk is on the publisher because nobody guarantees that a western game will success in china i mean how many chinese games success in us mm -hmm. exactly fair point yeah so 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 i i i've seen a lot in negotiation they will come to me and say Maciej, this game making 100 200 usrs per paying user you know why you give me such a small mg and i say look because we can't but we can offer you guarantee users amount you know and it will, we will say we guarantee you register users not in server register so they have to go inside the game finish the tutorial whatever whatever you count as register mm -hmm. we can guarantee you this but are those users gonna spend money we don't know it yet you know unless we do some soft launch but you can't do soft launch in china without proper um uh, government approval mm -hmm. unless you're doing the soft launch without monetization but then it's it's business it's all about money you know so so basically what's the point of the dev, of the publisher to see the metrics of harmonization uh retention uh yeah cool i mean you can have a great retention but that's not the mo main point for chinese publisher unless your game is based on the advertisements mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, um, well we're touching uh, uh, a new, new part here what's your um, approach towards in-app purchases and advertising in games like mm -hmm. which ones make more revenue and how, how do you view that mm. so um basically you you've been seeing the changes in the market uh it's it's fl fluctuate a lot when the gaming market started uh, you know everybody was very very excited about hyper casual games you know you remember your first iphone you know and everybody just played those little game for two minutes and then stop playing it mm -hmm. then we went to inside the games like game of war you know um which are much more uh uh mid-core to hardcore games uh for mobile and they make tons of money but the, now you see the trend is going back to hyper casual everybody's super excited about it you know like uh oh just make a game that lasts for some lasts for one hour and the game is dead some mm -hmm. lasts for three days you know mm -hmm. that you don't make money long term you make money today like super quick all right uh, return mm -hmm. this is not gonna last i mean um it's cool to have few ideas of the games but the users will get tired i mean users get tired when i play for 20 seconds and i see 30 seconds commercial mm -hmm. and it lasts for short term and then it just burst you know and uh, so in 2000 uh, 2017 you see playrix come up with the game called um uh, Gardenscape mm -hmm. and Gardenscape basically was uh, 
they first time they released Gardenscape, it was uh, it wasn't that good. So they re redo everything. They redo the whole game loop. You know, they it wasn't even match three game before. You know, mm -hmm. and they change it into match three game plus a story plus you building your garden and stuff like that. And it was an amazing success. So basically, you saw the casual game going into casual midcore with um, with not much attention to advertisements. Mm -hmm. They're still making okay money on the advertisement, but it's going into the in a purchase. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, to answer your question, you have to understand what's the genre of your game. If we are talking about light games, usually it's advertising. If we're talking about the uh, uh, midcore games, hardcore, it's usually almost all is um, um, in a purchase. In a purchase. But then if we're looking at the games like um, uh, games from Rovio, uh, mm -hmm. Angry Birds, or uh, Fingers of Hill Climb Racing uh, 1 and 2, or even uh, Subway Surfer, you know, mm -hmm. you will see that actually surprisingly the amount is in a purchase. It's like, sometimes it's like 60-70% of the whole revenue mm -hmm. coming from them. Um, why? Um, people sometimes are not afraid to spend one US dollar just to get rid of ads. <laughs> you know, if they really like the game, if you like some game, yeah. And exactly. a, this is a tricky question that I see in many games. Many developers do not give option to people to opt out from ads, right? Like for, for a cost of a dollar or two, depending on, on a, how popular the game is, they could offer people to opt out for ads, maybe even for a day or a week or permanently, right? right? That, that that's one of the best ways to monetize because somebody maybe want to play this game for a week. And he's willing to pay a dollar or right. two. Otherwise, if, if you're just bombarding them with, with video ads and right. reward ads, then they, they, they are simply going to delete the, the game. Yeah, and this is a good question. Uh, this is a good comment. You know, I see a lot of developers making a game uh, and they need to earn money from the ads. Like, mm -hmm. that's their own modernization strategy. But the guys does not think about how to hook the player into the game. So, when you see that successful game, like, for example, Match Street Game, you know, for example, King. They don't even force you to watch ads, and people play them, and then end up playing playing the ads because they need likes, for example. Yeah. So so you create the option for users. You don't force them to watch. But in in case you don't know how to make a good game loop, uh, you can still force the player. But at least give the player five to ten minutes after install. Don't don't see ads. Let them get hooked into the game. Let them experience what the game is about. Because when I play the game and I and I'm in the tutorial and I don't know how to play the game after 20 seconds <laughs> I'll die because I'm in tutorial I don't know and then I see 20, 30 seconds ads the first thing is I'm gonna delete it why because you're forcing me to watch the ads because I die in the tutorial and that it doesn't really make sense yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. in the learning process I'm in the process that I'm trying to get hooked mm. for the game okay we'll touch a couple of times on the government um, approval certificates and let's go straight to see uh, because for us outside of China it's super easy to publish a game all you need to is upload it to the store and start doing the marketing for it right and people are going to be back in China there are um, approval certificates right. for every game published is that right? Uh, is that, that's right yeah. and the, the, that certificate mainly is the name of the game that's how you get the, the certificate for your game uh, there are two certificates basically one is the copyright uh, certificate and for this one you can apply with an agent you don't need, you don't need a, a publisher or you can uh, ask a publisher for you to do it uh, basically the copyrights will uh, will say that you have the rights to the game and the game will need to be in Chinese basically mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very simple process and the second one once you get the copyright uh, approval then you can apply for ISBN mm -hmm. ISBN basically is the uh, uh, Chinese uh, approval process, which uh, recently is frozen. Um, uh, so frozen? You mean you mean nobody can get the the license today for China? Uh, basically, uh, it was since March till around December uh, twenty five, it was uh, blocked. Uh, so no games could, could get even approved. Since December twenty fifth, um, uh, the the government reopened the ISBN process, but. Just in the in this month in March, um, uh, the government say we have too many games in the backlog, about five thousand games, and they say we don't accept new approval till we finish all the games that previously 
uh, were uh, uh, waiting to, to be published. In exactly. China. So now, so now the government is approving uh, <coughs> games every week. We have a new ISBN about eighty to one hundred ten games every week. Recently, uh, the backlog is around five thousand. So mm -hmm. it would take maybe half year, maybe one year. To, so at this point, when we are in beginning, middle, late middle of the March, we have at least six months where no new game is going to be approved because they're cleaning the backlog. Yeah, they're cleaning the backlog, which if you're already inside the backlog, it's a good news for you. You don't have a new competition, but if you haven't applied for the game, you have to wait till the government. Now, two, two reasons why. One, one reason is because you got, uh, the government is changing their policies uh, for the for the video, uh, mm -hmm. for the for the video that you need to apply for the when you um, when you make a presentation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's require video, it require the presentation of the game, require all the all the um, um, character dialogue, uh, and so they changing all the small details within the application process. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one. The second thing is like uh, uh, the the whole process they want to simplify in the long term. Mm -hmm. So. This is the one one of the reasons they're changing the process. The second reason is uh, they uh, because of the backlog. Mm -hmm. So so now now it's being opposed. Uh, so we, I, basically, they, they want to get more specific with the, 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 the every individual game, so they can clearly have deep insight what game what is happening this right. game. And uh, you you think after they finish developing this approval system. It's going to be faster for the games to get in the market um, that comply with all the regulations, right? Well, that's what they say. <laughs> you know? But I mean, imagine from uh, last year, from uh, uh, from December to to February, they uh, it's from my memory, so mm -hmm. I might be a little bit off the numbers. Uh, last year was about one thousand eight hundred games. Uh, uh, the three months period. This year was about uh, four hundred. In three months. Yeah, in the same same sense. By now it's about seven hundred, but but it's slower than before, mm. you know. So uh, so for a Western developer, you know, uh, it's it's a tricky uh, situation. What to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Now there are a few few things they can do. Uh, they can still publish on iOS. Okay, so does iOS games have to comply with same rules? Uh, they do have to. Uh, comply but i mean right now nobody really pay attention to them mm -hmm. yeah so eventually uh they will there will be a clearance of those games like they will be in the store but in the future new games will need the isbn but right now it doesn't affect anything so if you have an ios game right you can straight start operating in china you don't need Anything you don't even need publisher, no? you don't even publish, right? right? And you only maybe need uh, to somebody to run a marketing campaign for yeah. you, or somebody needs to do uh, social right. outreach. But, um, but be careful with the marketing because, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you can get reported, then uh, the government will force Apple to remove the game, okay? Which I never heard it happen yet, okay? But you know, of course, but there is a risk, China, it's, it's a, there is a there's a risk, yeah. Uh, so so for that uh, for second thing that uh, what you can do right now uh, well we were talking about the um, uh, iOS mm -hmm. uh, if you have a PC uh, Steam is still uh, the platform you will go and publish mm -hmm. even uh, they plan to switch the Steam to a perfect world to become the Chinese Steam and stuff like that but right now it's still if you're in the PC uh, it's still okay. And how about how about the PC market? Let's go for a second. I know mm -hmm. WeChat has a WePlay, yeah, WePlay. Uh, some platform, right? And uh, they, at the time of the launch, they said uh, it's a perfect opportunity for everybody outside of China right. to bring their PC games through the Chinese market through WeChat Play platform. Uh, what happened there? Is that working? How it's working? Do you have any experience yeah. with that? Uh, well, it, when they launched it, there was no issue with ISBN from government. Okay. Now, it, now it is. And Tencent is the local company, uh, so they really have to make sure they listen to the um, uh, government the policies. Government policies. So, so, so they cannot really bring the games without the approval approval process. Mm -hmm. um, there is a one great arena uh, where games could get bring to China, 
both on uh, PC or uh, Android phones is when they don't have monetization. Mm -hmm. If the games basically monetize only through the advertisements, then they, in theory, that they don't need to get ISBN to, mm -hmm. to, to be launched in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, they should, but it's a very gray area right now. Mm -hmm. so there's no clear explanation about this. So, so that's why, especially last year, you see why so many publishers in China looking for hyper casual games is because they only monetize through advertisement. And mm -hmm. those are the type of games you can push them with power. Without ISBN, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 we, we were talking before about scalable games, right? right? Um, can you give us idea like non-scalable game, scalable game from your perspective? Um, everybody dreams about game that can last for three to five years. Everybody dreams to have a, a game that uh, they can launch and it make money and they can keep adding up, upgrades to the game, you know, and it's getting like a, a few examples would be, for example, Earth Mobile from IGG, you know, which is uh, the strategy game. Um, uh, any type of uh, King games, you know, Superstar games, you know, um, mm -hmm. that's a good example. Like Player I just mentioned uh, be, before. Those games are scalable. Those games are they can grow, uh, and once you reach the final level, or once you reach the, you know, like maximum power. You, you're never gonna get there. Why? Because the developer is gonna be faster than the player mm -hmm. in terms of development. And if it doesn't happen, developer should decrease speed of the player um, uh, progression. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's basically again number uh, number design. Um, Non-scalable games are basically the hyper casual games. Um, it's basically that's it's uh, it makes money. Uh, uh, the business uh, structure. You know, you create like every week you create two games as a small developer. You have five, ten people in your in your office, and you, every week you make one, two games like hyper casual, and you push like hundred games per year. You know, and you just show it. You know, you by a little bit of traffic, you see if they have uh, like an organic fraction. If they do, they get big. You earn some money on it. You know, maybe one game out of four hundred is successful. You can play that salary for everybody for one to three years. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's also a business model. It's yeah. all different. Uh, but but both are very risky, you know, like a gaming industry. Um, scale, scale of the process, you know, we are, when we're talking about the business, uh, from the publisher perspective, uh, currently um, our revenue shares, uh, after we pay all the fees, all the marketing, all the uh, third-party channels, third-party uh, tracking systems. You know, actually, the pro the re the profit is about two to four percent on a successful game, and this is very very low. You know, um, what about developers? It's the same thing. After they pay the cost for the tools, you know, cost for the salaries, offices, it's also very low. So there's very small uh, margin of error. Very very small. Well, I know, and how I can structure this. Is the highest fee at the beginning goes to a platform, right? right. They are taking up to thirty percent. We we see here in China, some are taking fifty, right. and we're not even going to talk about Southeast Asia, where right. it goes up to seventy, right? right. Per, per in a purchase. So uh, uh, if the store is taking like those thirty, we are talking about, and um, you have. Uh, I remember once in in conversation you mentioned uh, that the security is taking uh, ten percent. And uh, analytics take another ten percent of the of the revenue, and then you have a hosting if the game is scalable, taking an additional one, and then you have a publisher. That this really boils down to uh, working for very small um, revenue that's left after right. publishing a game. Now, sure. I is mean... is there is there a, a, a future where you're not using all these services, and uh, is there some? premium solution to some services? Is there any way that uh, uh, game developers basically can, let's say, unite right. to have some services or avoid paying some services in some way? Well, um, basically what we're paying is tools, you know. Um, suppose you're making, a, you're recording the video right now mm -hmm. and you will be paying Adobe to make the, to edit the video, yeah. for example. Yeah? yeah. So every month you're paying the tools. Yeah. I mean, Windows tools. 
this uh, this option you can make those tools yourself mm -hmm. but i don't think you will spend you know years just to develop a video editor right? yeah so basically a developer has a choice to um use the third party tools for example analytics you know like mm -hmm. AppSpire, like adjust you know like kochava or they can make their own mm -hmm. you know and to make them own, you know they could do that in, in theory they will have to go to facebook and have a use the bd power to uh connect to them they will have to go to google they will have to go all those big companies hundreds of uh third party advertising ch uh, channels and connect to them you know in theory they could do it you know i mean uh my previous company right uh, we had our bi system mm -hmm. and it's exactly the same that shows the third party analytics why don't we use our uh, bi system because we don't know where the traffic come from and mm -hmm. there's a difference and the third party they will tell us this traffic comes from Facebook, this traffic comes from organic, but our BI, we know the country, we know the age, we, we know everything, but we don't know from which channel. So that's, <laughs> so in theory, we could develop something like that and then, uh, and then uh, use it and then don't pay those service. So, but it's probably most, most likely the big companies, like, uh, and we're talking about like the biggest one will be buying those uh, big companies eventually, you mm -hmm. know? Um, Again. When you say this, you, you're, you're probably thinking about Google acquiring these analytic companies, uh, um, maybe Apple acquiring them. Uh, I eventually. think more likely uh, that the problem with Apple and Google that they are not publishers, they are the mm -hmm. channels, mm -hmm. you know. But if we are going into the next few years, you will see the channels starting to become publisher, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are not talking about the. Google well, they, they have to be published. They are taking thirty percent of the revenue, right? right? They, they, they are published by default. They're like a government, right? Yeah, but look, you are a developer and you put a game on the Google, and what's the chance that will feature you? Or Apple, what's the chance that will feature you? It's very very small, you know. Oh. And even even now, if they feature you, it's it doesn't really give you that much traction anymore as it used to, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as that powerful and every day there's the more ads there is and but the but there's only one one day a day you know like 24 hours and every every day there's like so many new games on the market so they kind of just do everything the same way you know and then you have a big games that they need to feature again and again that's a that's a problem they those stores though they will not be a publisher but what i'm talking about is the third party stores that mm -hmm. eventually will go into the uh, publishing and we're talking about recently uh, fonts like xiaomi uh, mm -hmm. oppo you start to see their bd people everywhere asking to bring the game to their channels why is because because uh they want to grow competition to google uh amazon is pushing hard you know uh, all these companies and eventually i i, I predict those companies once they develop very large uh, MAU uh, mm -hmm. monthly users, they will go into publishing. That's what Tencent does. They have the platform, they have their own traffic, and they are also the publisher. Mm -hmm. And those kind of companies will have enough money to actually acquire those analytics or marketing agencies or uh, 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 KOL agencies. Uh, th those companies will, will acquire them. A uh, pub third party publisher, sm small to the average size, they will still use third party tools. And you will see the, the market starting to segregate, segregate a, a bit. Mm. Okay, the, 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 that's quite a lot of information and, and really insightful, right? Really sure. insightful uh, from, from your side and, and years of experience. Um, let, let, let's uh, just take a look maybe for uh, a moment the newest news that just happened on GDC. If, right. if you're familiar with Google product coming to the market, Google sure. Stadia, we just did an awesome video about that, <laughs> and uh, it really explains how it works. We had many um, questions, but what's your take on cloud gaming, mm -hmm. and uh, what do you think about Google Stadia uh, at all? So the cloud gaming has been on and off for many years. Actually, mm -hmm. it's not a new thing, you know. Um, the excitement uh, shouldn't be there, but there is. And the reason why is because this is the first time in our history that a big company, like number one company, taking 
taking over this. And what I'm talking about number one companies in terms of servers, in terms of cloud power, you know, if it was IBM, I'll be excited. If it's Google, I'd be excited. Even if it's the, you know, Wanda cloud, I'll mm -hmm. be excited, you know, or, or over the company. Um, why? Because we have the power or those companies have the power to actually make it happen. We had PlayStation try to do that before. We had the Xbox. We had a few years ago, another company tried to do it, but it was, they didn't have enough power to do it. Enough. When you, you're talking about computing power, cloud power, cloud um, user? Band, bandwidth, cloud power. Uh, but this is one thing. The second, everybody always worries, sure, how much internet connection I'm going to use up, right? Mm -hmm. Can I can I actually handle it? And the answer is yes, 5G is coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, 5G is entering more and more markets. I mean, soon it will, it will be faster to transfer files from from across the globe than your hard drive speed, yeah, yeah. you know? 5G is really, really... Yeah, so so it's the it just it's just right timing, you know. Mm -hmm. It's if you ever watch the movie uh, Play Already One, mm -hmm. you know everybody inside the VR uh, imaginary world, you know. That's before this can happen. You need to have a cloud-based gaming system mm -hmm. because it's uh, it's all it's all digital. It's all in the cloud, mm -hmm. you know. At the same at the same time, you know. Uh, uh, the like a uh, uh, digital currency coming out, you know, uh, that let people uh, be be like a global village, you know, mm -hmm. globalization. Um, it's all at the right timing. Will success probably yes, but we still don't know any details like how it's gonna be monetized, how it's going to be evolved. I mean, look. I can like they show the assassin, uh, assassin Creed, Creed, yeah. yeah game uh, in the in the demo and my question is do I still need to buy the game mm -hmm. or do I pay like monthly uh, monthly uh, like a subscription from from what I heard from some of my friends from mm -hmm. Google is mm, that uh, that the idea is that it's only going for be, to be for AAA games right for uh, very high end games and um, the 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 whole idea is that. They want to go after the, the highest market, especially esports. Right. The, the, their main main competitors are consoles and uh, Twitch. Right. Streaming service. Right. They want to push this, let's say, smaller players right. out and, and dominate this part for for the time being in AAA. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. But again, the how they charge a player. Because imagine like I buy uh, right now. I have to buy the Assassin Creed. Mm -hmm. And I go on Steam, uh, 60 US, boom, I get the game, right? Later, do I have to pay a subscription every month to have access to that? Or do I need to buy special DLC to get cloud access? Mm -hmm. That means I have to spend more money as a player. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear yet how they're going to do it. And they also didn't announce your, uh, Asia to be mm -hmm. launching. And why not? So, so. So the company like Tencent will just take it over, you know, and we have a one size Google, one size Tencent. It's good for business, not good for the users, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, my feelings about this are mixed, you know, I'm very excited, you know, finally, I mean, I mean, I, I bought my PSP a mm -hmm. uh, long time ago just to play the PlayStation from games when I'm in the bed, you know, <laughs> so I'm, my PS4 is downstairs. And I'm in my house on the third floor. I'm playing PSP, like all the cool games. Perfect. But now I can do it on the, on the phone. You know, just connect my controller. Per perfect. This is every time I wanted to do it. You know, mm. um, I actually was thinking, can I find my like super old, like uh, uh, Intel Pentium One? Yeah, try that one. <laughs> yeah, try to 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 that one. You know, if it's gonna work, it. You know. No, but uh, the, you you're touching the right point. I want to ask you is what do you think about the whole idea of hardware independent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, because this is going to be cloud independent. That means you never have to upgrade your your computer anymore, and you can get awesome graphic, right? And you can have a great game experience. You're dependent on the bandwidth, and right. um, mostly that's it. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of uh, futuristic uh, designs, uh, ideas. What's going to happen, and. Uh, later you can put in the comments below. Uh, there's a website called uh, Future Timeline, mm -hmm. and basically it predicts 
what's gonna happen in our in technology progress, you know, mm -hmm. from now all the way till Matrix or yes, Terminator, yes. right? Yes, and basically um, this is uh, the step in evolution, not just for gaming but for everything, uh -huh. for the medical, for the uh, traffic, you know, for uh, police. Uh, it's all going to be in the cloud. Um, and it's a it's a good thing, you know. It's a it's a it's a good thing because um, uh, for for a user, um, you know, like right now, you know, we carrying big laptops with us and it's very heavy and everything. Later, I, you know, they they have those portable phones that you can fold it, you know. Later, you can just have a carry like a small device in your pocket, take it out. You have a screen, you can do anything you need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can be productive anywhere in the world. You know, without carrying a like, book of hardware with you, um, it's not good news for the hardware companies. If you like a company that, that <laughs> yeah, uh, focusing on the uh, consoles or focusing on the uh, gaming PCs, you know, or if you're Intel that's making most of its revenue from selling yeah. newest and newest chips, and now a a a uh, ADM is going to provide everybody with a enterprise cloud. Uh, yeah. Processors that nobody but, but not upgrade anymore. But it's it's also different because now their business uh, uh, ways need to change. Right now, it's like back in the back in the day, everybody bought Nokia, and Nokia didn't move with the progress. Yes. And Nokia died. If, now they need to change the business into the cloud. Mm -hmm. If they do it, then they will grow. Look like IBM. Back then, they just making the PCs. Mm -hmm. And it was such a small business. Now it's one of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows what IBM does, you know? <laughs> it's, it, it's true. So, so... <laughs> well, actually, yeah. actually, this is a great moment. Yeah. IBM is one of the sponsors of this channel. And this is amazing, <laughs> amazing ad. Only the people in business know what actually IBM is doing. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even know, right? Yeah, well, it's like totally fun. We, have, we have amazing partnership with IBM. Like they, they sponsor a lot of uh, stuff in our company, and it's a um, truly remarkable relationship. Um, please, please continue. Sure. So, so, you know, it has to be in the cloud, like uh, whatever. And for the gamer, you know, like I had a conversation um, uh, previously, and and uh, and people say so. Oh, everybody said for 20, 30 years that PC gaming is dying. Mm -hmm. And I told them, the PC gaming is dying, console gaming is dying, but the game is never going to die. Yeah. Because the way we're going... Imagine yourself sitting in front of the computer and playing games. I don't think it's going to happen in 10 years. Uh, you will be still sitting in front of something, but it's, it probably is going to be just a screen or projector or mm -hmm. virtual reality. But the hardware it's not gonna be in your home it might be in your home it might be in your uh, phone you know mm -hmm. the hardware is gonna be going to nanoscale you know mm -hmm. it might be in the car it might be in your phone we don't know well from from my experience and my understanding i'm expecting that hardware is going to get smaller and smaller right. and more portable right and that uh, you will have some kind of projectoring or some kind of uh, i'm not necessarily convinced it's going to be vr mm -hmm. honestly I'm more convinced of the Microsoft approach of uh, AR, mm -hmm. uh, argumented reality, where you have a feed, uh, video feed right. that's uh, able to project something you are interacting with. Uh, because <clears throat> from everything that, that exists on the market today, nothing is getting user. For example, Facebook bet the company on VR. Right. And the, the, the Facebook is now like so completely wasted. Right. Since acquisition of... Um, since acquisition of Instagram, they haven't made any hit yet, right? right. It's unclear how they're gonna monetize WhatsApp. There's mm -hmm. no way of monetizing it as it is now. Right. And a lot of people are moving away from Facebook in a certain way. So um, I'm really curious about what Facebook is going to come out uh, mm -hmm. with, what their um, secret weapon in this war is going to be, because from everything we mentioned, we can clearly see Google pulling uh, right throwing a big bet front and companies like Apple and Microsoft and uh, Sony and Nintendo are kind of feeling this moment like right. left behind. So I I'm so excited for, for the next um, five years in our mm -hmm. industry, what's going to happen and who's going to swing 
uh, uh, forward to, to, to match them. Because if you really think deeply, this is exactly the same moment Nokia was when iPhone was first time uh, introduced. The people gathered around Nokia were mostly like talking, oh, iPhone is, yeah. is, is not going to do gadget. anything. Yeah, yeah gadget. And uh, I think the, the more, more people in our game industry today are saying like, ah, this Google uh, streaming might uh, not work. Right. right? And um, I think that, that was, won't be very wise. In, in the sure, universe. I mean, um, I'm not sure if you know that Nintendo, uh, the new CEO, he mentioned that uh, the Nintendo Switch is probably the last console Nintendo will ever make. Mm -hmm. So he pretty much predicted it's everything goes to cloud. And instead he said, we should focus on our content. We have amazing IPs, we can monetize it. That's the idea. Now, Sony and, Sony and uh, Microsoft, they don't really need consoles. Mm -hmm. Because they don't really make that much money on those. How about Xbox? Uh, they don't make much money on those consoles. What they make money is from the platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, they basically every time you buy a game, they get the percentage of the game has to go to the just just like mm -hmm. a Google Play on iOS. You know, it's same thing. So the war will be about not the hardware. The war will be like who controls the online space. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be, I think, that's what we're gonna see in the next five, ten years. And you mentioned about the VR. Um, the reason why VR like fail in my eyes, it's not because of the concept. The concept is amazing. Yeah, the concept is good. Uh, it's because of the, you know, it takes <laughs> you ten minutes to put the damn helmet on your yeah, head, yeah. you know, and then once you successfully like, <laughs> they ask you to hold your control, and you're like, where's the control? You know, so you have to take it out, find the controller, and then put another 10 minutes, and then you like choke you on the cables. That was a big problem with the VR. Once it become, goes to the cloud, computing, everything, and you just have a screen in front of you, that could work. Yeah, actually, now when you, when you start thinking about VR, uh, uh, cloud uh, yeah. might actually be a recipe yes. that's gonna work. Yeah, yeah that, that could be. That, that could was be, the yeah. basically original, the Google Glass idea. Mm -hmm. You have the glasses and you see everything, it was AR, but cover it, it become VR. Yeah, well, I think Google was bad at the time there was no technology yeah. that could execute on it, but I think today somebody with uh, some Google Glass type of right. concept might actually have a shot. Sure. And I think a lot of people would bet their money <laughs> that, that that might be successful. Wow, this was a really amazing and insightful um, Talk. I'm so glad you were uh, our guest. Sure. And uh, do you have uh, anything you want to share for, for the end? Mm, just thank you everyone to if you guys still still here watching it. Yeah. You know, thank you for um, uh, listening to us speaking and um, I'll be happy to uh, jump in on the uh, comments and answer any questions if you have. Yeah. Okay guys, you heard a lot insightful uh, information. If you are interested in reaching out uh, and you have any additional question, please follow up. We are almost on all platforms, both in China and outside of China. And uh, if you have an awesome game, just shoot our way and we're happy to recommend somebody to you. Take care, guys, and see you in the next show. Bye-bye.